Coming up on today's Locked On Bucks, do the Bucks have a doppelganger in terms of teams out there in the NBA? There are some comparisons being made between the Bucks and one recently eliminated team. Plus, we take a look at those four remaining teams in the NBA playoffs. How do the Bucks stack up against them? What can they learn from them in terms of their roster evaluation and building? We take a look at all of that and a high level view at the improbable Eastern Conference Finals after this on Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked on Bucks. I'm Justin Garcia, joined by Camille Davis. We thank you for making Locked on Bucks your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on YouTube as well, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. You can also find Camille on the Technical File Podcast, uh, on the Carry the GNMKE Podcast, and the Pack-A-Day Podcast. You can hear me on the Bucks Radio Network. And today's episode of Locked On Bucks is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet, that is right, $150 bucks with any winning $5 bet, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Uh, we briefly touched on the four teams that remain in the playoffs on yesterday's show, Camille. One of those four is the Denver Nuggets. And uh, this was ripped directly from Bucks Reddit, from MKE Bucks Reddit, as I saw this post late Sunday evening after that game, early Monday morning, and thought, huh, you know, I kind of wonder the same thing, and there's some things there. Um, I forget who the author of this post was, but uh, if you listen to Lockdown Bucks, you know it's you. So thank you for the inspiration behind this uh, segment of the show. But that is, are the Bucks actually the Denver Nuggets, but two years in advance? So there are some parallels there. I, I think we can primarily agree the Nuggets are in a better spot uh, in terms of the age of their roster and especially their best players and some of the roster construction as a whole. Some of the young guys that they saw uh, featured much more in the playoffs than the Bucks did with their young players. But when you go line by line, mm -hmm. there are some things that are a little hard to ignore here. Giannis. There, yeah, there yeah, are. I, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I was going to say Giannis entering the league two years prior to Nikola Jokic winning back-to-back -back MVPs, two years prior to Nikola Jokic doing that, the Bucks winning a title two years prior to the Denver Nuggets doing that. So uh, by those numbers, unfortunately for Nuggets fans, you are due for back-to-back uh, -back first round exits the next two years. <laughs> Yeah, if they really are the Bucks, that is what is coming the next two years for the Denver Nuggets, which honestly, when you look at the Western Conference landscape, and I mean the fact that the Nuggets did lose in the second round here, ensuring that we'll have our six different NBA champion in six years, like parity is here. Parity is here in the NBA. So like it's quite possible for that to happen. But no, that's honestly part of why last year when the Bucks were put out, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for Denver in these playoffs. Like I'm just going to have a general rooting interest in what happens with the Denver Nuggets because I felt a lot of the same conversations that happened around Jokic happened around Giannis as well of just kind of not quite understanding how he's the best player for different reasons, of course. I mean, the Giannis narrative was filled in part uh, by the comments of a certain player calling him, you know, run and dunk man so many years ago and letting that kind of marinate with how people uh, perceived Giannis as a player and then come the finals with him having a 50 ball and a closeout game, knocking down his free throws, just really showing his dominance and all around game. It's one of those moments where you felt like the questions have been answered, like Giannis finally did this. And with Jokic last year, finally getting to the top of the mountain, it was a similar conversation, especially with the MVPs where it's like, how is this guy in the running? What is he doing? Is Denver really that good? So on and so forth. So I could definitely see why somebody would see Denver and see Milwaukee and say there are some similarities here, especially when we look at the timeline of the MVPs and the championships between the two franchises. And given the fact that neither one had won championships in ages, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, never for the Denver Nuggets, and it had been 50 years for the Bucs. And I think that's the interesting part of these final four teams. You you hinted at it in that parody is here. You know, like for years, I, I think one of the big deterrents to becoming an NBA fan, especially if you were in Milwaukee, was, well, my team doesn't have a chance. You know, you go into the season knowing there's two to three teams that have a realistic chance to win the championship when I was growing up, that was the Bulls with Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. you, you pretty much knew they were going to come out of the Eastern Conference. And then you had maybe two teams in the West. You said, well, they can reach the finals, and who knows? You know, who, who knows what happens there? Then you advance where you had the two year dynasty of the Houston Rockets. Before you knew it, it was Kobe and Shaq and the Lakers and the Spurs. That it, it, it's really been five teams up until these last what, six years that you looked at and said, these are the teams that are running the league. It's going to be the sixth straight season. We've had a different champion. Mm -hmm. And it's what, the fifth straight year where the reigning champ is knocked out in the second round of the playoffs. I is that good for the league? I think so. I think so. There's, there's, there's arguments for both sides of it. So, one part of it, like I think back to when the finals were ran by the Cavs and the Warriors, where it was like everybody knew for like a four or five year stretch where it was like, it's going to be the Warriors and it's going to be the Cavaliers. I mean, they met in four straight NBA finals as it is, and everybody kind of felt those were predetermined outcomes. And people watched. They got massive ratings because you were seeing the same two teams against each other, uh, building that rivalry between the two, especially in 2017 after the Warriors had one, the Cavs had one. It's like, who's going to get that tiebreaker yep. uh, between the two franchises? So that does draw some attention, especially during playoff time, to see if these two you know, favorites can make Make it there uh, but the other side of that is there were some people turned off because they're like what am i even watching the playoffs for when i know how this is going to end and over the last six years now including this year um it's been a crapshoot where you're like i don't quite know like i mean 2019 the warriors still got there uh but the injuries of course and the raptors won with the Kawhi there and then after that you got lakers bucks warriors who you know bounced back again? They they made sure that their name was was brought back up again, and then the Nuggets. So it was like now this year it's going to be either the Mavericks, the Wolves, the Pacers, or the Celtics getting in there, and it's like that's another new team into the mix here. And I think that not knowing how the outcome is going to be actually adds to the product because I mean. When you're even thinking about this playoff run that we've had here, a lot of people haven't talked about the Boston Celtics series too much because they felt the outcome is predetermined. Like, well, we know the Celtics are going to beat the Miami Heat without Jimmy Butler. We know the Celtics are going to beat the Cavs, especially now that Donovan Mitchell was hurt, so on and so forth. So having the best possible matchups, I think, makes it more interesting because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So, uh, I, first of all, I agree in that, I think we saw less and less interest. It's still an issue that needs to be addressed, and the league has, has started to take some steps to do so. But when we were talking about really the nadir of interest in the regular season being there for, for basketball fans, it was within the last five years. Mm -hmm. And that was coming out of four straight years of Cavs versus Warriors, the Warriors in the finals year after year. You would tune in because you wanted to see somebody beat the Warriors after they won their yep. first championship. But I think there was just a lot of malaise and boredom with the regular season. And it it's going to be a process to come out of that. Things like the in-season tournament are going to help you out there. And I think we've seen some boosts there. But yeah, I mean, for the longest time, we all opined for, man, why can't it be like the NFL? Where mm -hmm. you, you start to get teams that come up out of nowhere. And we're here when we talk about a different champion six years in a row. And I think this year especially. Now, granted, I, I think you, you probably would have said the same thing in 2021 when you look back at that Final Four and you saw the Phoenix Suns, the Atlanta Hawks, the Milwaukee Bucks as three teams in there. This year, with the Mavs, who have been in the finals two times in the last 20 or so years, um, the Celtics, who are obviously a staple in, in terms of league history, but then you have the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Indiana Pacers. So we're starting to move closer and closer to that NFL model where it really could be any team but the Jaguars and the Cleveland Browns and the, and the Detroit Lions for the most part. But that's where we're at. And, and I do think it's good. And I think there can be a tipping point, though, where, uh, look, 
football is king and they're never going to run into this issue. But for people like me, I've talked about this before. I really miss the days of the NFL where you had these traditional dynasties because it meant something to beat that team. Um, it's not quite the same conversation in basketball because it's a seven game series. And if you mm -hmm. win that series, it is earned. Um, but that's going to be interesting. If What if we get to the point that it's 10 or 11 consecutive years where it is a different champion every single year? And with that, I mean, you got to look at what's happening this year and what we see generally every year as well, because if it is that much parity, it's like teams are an injury or two away from really shifting how the season unfolds at that point. Um, I mean, we saw it with the with the Knicks and it's kind of like they were giving all they had, giving all they had. And they just finally eventually ran out of steam. Yeah. Uh, just legs aren't fresh anymore. Injuries catching up. And if things are really all that close where there is true parity, it's like you're a sprained ankle or whatever it is away from really having a different outcome than what you thought was going into that series. So um, there is something to having a, peren a perennial favorite. And I think that's what you see a bit with this year with the framing kind of being like the old guard and the, the new guard of the NBA coming up. And it's like, which is going to really get that battle done. Um, so there's something to it, but I do think that with the NBA and the fact that they have series, like you mentioned, which takes that like any given Sunday or, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever days NFL are playing on now. Um, it takes that out of it, but I think there's going to be a, an interest going forward right now with the the changing of the guard in the NBA uh, because that's what you're really seeing in these playoffs as well. We've, we've seen it in every sport, right? Um, uh, what, in the last 20 years? And uh, you saw it in baseball where it was no longer just the Yankees that were winning every World Series. We touched on football. The NHL has, has been all the way over there in the other extreme where it's it's always different teams uh, other than Vegas, it seems like, representing in the uh, Stanley Cup final each year. And uh, college basketball, too, when you think of the NCAA tournament and the upheaval we've seen there with um, with 16 seeds beating one seeds and, and the teams that have re reached the final four in the last few years. And, and now it's here in basketball. And that last point you made, I think, is the most important one when it comes to some of these comps that we'll get back to and how you evaluate your roster, and that is luck, how important it is to be lucky and healthy, that one injury can seemingly tip the scales of the entire postseason, as we've seen for the Bucks three straight years now that we're talking about. So we'll get into that conversation coming up after the break here on Locked on Bucks. Well, right now it's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home the winnings of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. It's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And uh, Camille, as we mentioned, you can find the Locked On Sports Today channel out there for free 24 7. Get it on YouTube, Amazon Fire TV channels app. Uh, we touched yesterday on the coverage that existed in the Eastern Conference Finals for a very pro Knicks broadcast. You don't have to worry about any of that type of stuff with the Locked On Sports Today channel. Again, it's free. It's 24-7. You can find it on YouTube or the Amazon Fire TV channels app. You get uh, insights, analysis, the expert opinions that you've come to expect from all the local experts here on Locked On, your team every day. Uh, speaking of those comps, so uh, as I mentioned, there are some similarities and uh, it was government doing stuff was the uh, poster of that on the MKE Bucks subreddit. So shouts to that poster. But there are certainly some some comps that line up there. I think the big things that we mentioned were and, and look, even to, I suppose, a smaller extent to Michael Malone and his career as a head coach and finally breaking through and experiencing yeah. that success. Mike Budenholzer had regular season success, but that was always the knock on him was the postseason. Um, but again, as, as mentioned before, the spot where the Nuggets hold a clear advantage 
is, I think, the age of their roster and their roster construction. They're in a somewhat similar spot to the Bucks As of this moment, they're about $6 million under that uh, second apron level. That's with 10 guys that are guaranteed to be under contract next season. So you got to add three more, and you would assume you're going to go over, right, because of the, mm-hmm. the veterans' minimums at most. So pretty similar spot to where the Bucks are, are at. Granted, the Bucks are going to be deeper into that second apron. Um, but it's really Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray that run the show there. Aaron Gordon has basically taken that role as the number three guy. And for the Bucks, one, two, and three is a lot more clear. Where it's it's Giannis and Dame, and Chris Middleton is uh, number three. But again, Nikola Jokic, twenty nine. Jamal Murray's twenty seven. Uh, Aaron Gordon is somehow only twenty eight right now and about to turn twenty nine. And then you have Michael Porter Jr., who's one of those young guys that had a relatively disappointing postseason. So there's some similarities. There's a lot of differences, however. But when looking at this Nuggets team and this Bucks team and all teams that are left standing, I think the big piece was that last point that you made about you know a rolled ankle. Anything can really swing a couple of weeks of the postseason. And in the past, with the way the teams were structured, that might not matter, right? You mm-hmm. you probably still have enough to get past teams in the first and second round, but especially as we've seen this Eastern Conference shift to to basically what the West had been for the last twenty years, where there is no easy out, and you're going to get tough opponents every single round. That's really added to it, where you see teams like the Bucks being sent home early. The 76ers, once again, have yet to reach a conference final. I think, you know, I, I was listening to the low post earlier today when Zach Lowe was talking about who is the second best team in the Eastern Conference. And I I, I suppose there's a number of ways you can take that. You can take it as the good of, hey, there's a lot of parity and balance in the conference or the bad of what happened to those days when you had two or three very clear dominant teams and you knew, okay, one of these is it's going to be like musical chairs and one of these teams is going to be left without a spot to sit in the conference finals, that's gone away. And I I really think the story of this postseason so far has been injuries. And that's not to take away from what teams like Minnesota and Indiana have done, but there's just no avoiding that subplot to this postseason. Yeah, I mean, that that is what it is. Like sometimes the truth is one of those things where you're like, I don't really want to talk about this because it makes it look kind of ugly. But I mean, that is what it is. And it doesn't negate or lessen the accomplishments that any team's necessarily making because it is still an accomplishment to win playoff series. Like this is what you've been playing for all year. You cannot control when injuries happen, so on and so forth. You can only continue to roll. And to your point about parity, I guess one could look at it and say the parity in the East is a little different than the parity in the West, where people argue like the West parities because they're good and the East parities because there's a lot more bad mixed in there. But uh, the way I look at it is just a, actually like a larger league uh, view of it, because Adam Silver has been talking about trying to you know expand the league. He wants to add more teams into the league. And you think about when that normally happens, it normally waters down the talent and you see so many more bad teams pop up because you're spreading a, a thinner player pool over more teams. But given the the rise of basketball internationally, how much international interest there is in the game, how many different pathways there are into the NBA right now as well with college basketball being a thing for sure. But you can go G League, you can go uh, take a year off, you can go overseas. There's so many different routes to take now to get to the NBA where, you know, 30 years ago, it was either you're going straight from high school to the league or you're going to college and then you're going into the NBA. So I think having more pathways, more development avenues and just more talent, especially with the game growing internationally, uh, is is a benefit, not just for the parity that we're talking about now, but thinking down the line when the league looks to expand and add more teams. Uh, I wouldn't expect as watered down of a product there just because there are so many talented players in the league right now. Now, the question is, how long will that be sustainable? You know, some draft classes are going to be weaker than others, so on and so forth. But um, that's part of what's fun about the league now. And I also mentioned just on that note, just the young guys coming in and, and really making their stamp and trying to do like their legacy, build their legacies right now in the playoff. Cause this is when you build it. And to the point about injuries and the young guys, 
this is also when guys can step up because like who would have thought like Deuce McBride for the Knicks would become somebody where you're like, wow, like that kid, like he can really, really hoop. He got an opportunity uh, for this Knicks team and really made the most of it. I mean, you saw PJ Washington coming on for the Mavericks throughout their series where at first it was like the Thunder were like, go ahead, PJ, and just shoot, do whatever you're going to do. And eventually that coverage had to change uh, on him as well. So it's always fun seeing stars grow to see young guys taking, you know, taking leaps, seeing legacies get defined, uh, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I think the parody is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's better than where we were Uh I don't know if I would say that, that the right spot is somewhere in the middle. It's it's probably closer to this parody thing because it's just going to increase the interest in investment and amount of fans that are going to follow the product all season long because it, it's easy to tune out in the regular season when you know these games don't really matter for my team. We're not going to make the playoffs, and we're certainly not going to beat the Warriors or the Cavs in the playoffs. So I, I do think it's it's headed in the right direction here for the league. Um, my big question going into next season is something you and I have talked about uh, a couple of times already on this show, and I do want to get into that and one other theory that was floated out there about this Bucks team and what it could mean for next year. As, as again, we look at the four teams that are left, not a whole lot of great comps for the Bucks <laughs> when you think about how their rosters are constructed, but are there some things that you can take away from those teams? So. We'll get into all of that as we start to wrap things up after this on Locked on Bucks. Well, Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You pick just more than or less than on only two or more player stats and from there, watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with basketball, hockey, and more on prize picks. America's number one fantasy sports app. And get in on the playoff action while you still can. Up to 100 times your money, you can win on prize picks as you and the world's best players Take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Download the app and use the code Locked On NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That code again, Locked On NBA, L O C K E D O N N B A for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, so as we uh, start to wrap things up on today's show here, Camille, again, the when you look at these the Bucks and their current construction, again, as, as we've touched on a couple of times here, I think the the only givens that we know are Giannis, uh, Chris Middleton, and Damian Lillard are going to be on this roster next season. You get the feeling maybe it's only two of the three between Marjan Bochamp, A.J. Green, and Andre Jackson Jr. that are going to be on this team. Maybe one of them is moved in in some other deal. Um, I know we're going to touch on this with Ty coming up on tomorrow's show, but I wonder what that means for that uh, draft pick as we touched on as well with, with Brian of Bucks Film Room. There's only so many ways you can get young. You're not going to go half of your roster young or everybody but Giannis, Dame, and Chris. So, um, there are going to be some changes coming to this roster, and the Bucks have a little bit of avenues, a few avenues, I should say, that they can explore for that. But if we comp them to the remaining teams, really the only one that stands out the most or stands up the most is probably the Celtics. When you look at how they're constructed, that they have more of a mix of vets and uh, young guys. Timberwolves, by and large, are still a younger team that is, it feels like, are on the rise. Certainly older pieces and Mike Conley, to a lesser extent, Rudy Gobert as well. But Anthony Edwards isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Dallas Mavericks are a pretty similar story as they've kind of retooled that roster, it seems like, three straight years. Yep. And here they are in another conference finals under Luka Doncic. And then you have the Indiana Pacers, who are a very – young team and uh, seemingly fitting that role of 2021 Atlanta Hawks that somehow <laughs> crashed the party here. 
Uh, so in terms of the comps, it's not great for the Bucks. I just keep going back to that point that you made, and we've touched on a couple of times, injuries and how much they can swing this. There are some things you can do to put yourself in a better spot. A part of that is developing young talent. Again, easier said than done, and that's more of a discussion we'll get into with Ty. But the big thing I come back to is, you know, I wonder, as much as Bucks fans, I just talked about interest in the regular season. You may not want to hear it. I wonder if the big takeaway from this postseason is, look, we need to play these guys less in the regular season. The regular season is for Andre Jackson Jr. It's for A.J. Green. It's for Marjan Bochamp. If you haven't, if you keep your first round pick, it's for that player. Uh, we can feed you guys to the Wolves in the regular season, but we pick our spots with the rest of them, and maybe we work in more rest because we've seen for three straight postseasons now, and really two of them more than the other one, health is of the utmost importance for this team. It truly is. And that's one of the things about being a tending team. Like normally you're an older, more vet led team. So normally like player development and vet team doesn't go together. But to your point, if that's an avenue they look to explore where they're lessening the minutes of some of those uh, vets that we're you know, counting on with Giannis, with Dame, with Chris, uh, then it opens up some playing time for the young guys. And honestly, the best experience for young NBA players to get better is playing in the game. Um, that's something that Marjan mentioned in his first year where he was like he was scared to make mistakes because he knew he was getting pulled right away under Mike Budenholzer where he just didn't have a long leash to figure it out because that was a team on the clock like hey we know what we're trying to accomplish we don't really have that time for this right now last year this past season that we just saw wrap up um, you saw some young guys sprinkled in there too but once they started really getting going we saw them leave the lineup for large stretches at a time until we saw some injuries also kind of sparks some like, okay, let's get a couple of minutes in here for some of these guys. And on top of that with Doc Rivers, he mentioned just not being familiar with a lot of those young guys. So he didn't really even know what they could do to throw them in the game. So uh, that whole aspect of like, we want our young guys to play normally comes like in contradiction of we're also a championship team. So it's trying to find that right balance uh, for the development of the young guys. And we talked about it yesterday with the rumors of Sam Cassell coming to Milwaukee if he doesn't get the Lakers job. Like player development is something else that he is known to be pretty good at. Um, and one other thing that to say that you made me think of when you were talking about comps of teams that are left in the playoffs, it reminded me of what Pat Riley actually said after the Heat were put out the playoffs. And he mentioned the fact that, you know, there were eight teams that paid luxury tax this season. Mm -hmm. And only two of them made it out of the first round of the playoffs. Like that's the company the Bucks are in because the Bucks were one of those six teams that did not make it um, out of the first round despite paying luxury tax along with the Clippers, Warriors, Suns, Heat, and the Lakers. Um, a lot of teams that have some similarities with how the roster is constructed with the Bucks. So that's a question too of like how do you pivot uh, from being in this particular spot where you're a luxury team with the salary caps on and so forth, uh, but you weren't even able to make it out the first round. What do you need to retool and tweak to try to get over to that next level? Um, and if you can find some young role players to hit on your team, that would be a boom for the Bucks because as we discussed, you know your core is Giannis and Chris and Dame. If you can find some defense around them, some athleticism around them, it's going to go a long way for the Milwaukee Bucks. And uh, look, this certainly isn't um, anything that's a unique take or um, perspective on on things. But when we talk about that parity and going back to that that comment and the point made by Pat Riley that you referenced. Um, the way things are set up in this collective bargaining agreement, it's going to be in, in, not impossible, but it's going to be very tough to yeah. sustain that level of success for what? Probably more than two years. Like you're probably looking at best case scenario for any team is back to back championships because uh, within that structure, you know, you're going to hit the two or, or excuse me, the, the three or four year mark where you're having to re sign and pay your guys that your roster is just going to get expensive, especially if you're at that level. Think about Oklahoma City, right? They have a very bright future. It's a good team. You can keep that group together, but you're going to end up in that second apron eventually because you're going to have to max out Shea Gilgis Alexander. You're going to have to pay uh, Jalen Williams. You're going to have to find somebody else. Maybe it's Chet Holmgren that you're paying, but you, you, you very quickly 
go from this spot where, man, this team is good and on the rise to before you know it, you're in that first apron and you're really starting to approach the second apron, which the older you get, you're going to get there. And that's those teams like we referenced, the Bucks, the Phoenix Suns, yeah. the Celtics are there. The Denver Nuggets, as we mentioned earlier in the show, they are going to be there. So that's really the biggest change in, in what has really helped usher this in or is, is going to, I should say, because I think this – next season this upcoming season is going to be the first year where teams really feel the effects of that mm -hmm. it went into place last year but it was still new and, and that was the year where we saw the suns just say screw it we're we're taking on all the money that we can and, and it wasn't just phoenix we saw other teams say we don't care we'll figure it out later it's it's like a credit card i'm buying this stuff now i think i'll have the money to pay it off and it hasn't worked out for those teams so i do wonder if we see any reevaluation there uh, not necessarily from the Bucks, from any team that just says, you know, maybe just these two guys are important. And if we can turn this one piece into two or three that that we feel like are at least rotational players, mm -hmm. that's the biggest part. Because I think that's the other piece of what we've seen in the postseason here is depth and the importance yep. of depth. It, it's It's got to be good depth, right? And we're not talking about playing 10 deep, but you have to have at the very least seven guys on your roster that you say if push comes to shove i don't care the scenario or situation we feel comfortable putting them on the floor in the playoffs and if we're being honest with ourselves i don't think that number is at seven for the bucks right now yeah probably not like seven is the least but like if you can have eight then you really are like You're we have very good. really yeah. good depth at this point especially when the the eight seven eight guys that you are playing um you can mix and match to be able to throw out different looks for the opposing team as well necessarily not saying your identity changes every time that you you know you're having different lineups but when the situation calls for it can you go from as the bucks have done like can you go from playing drop to a switch heavy defense can you trap what can what all can you throw at the opposing team here uh to try to win that chess game in the playoffs because that's another aspect of playoff basketball where you're seeing the same team over and over and over again. I mean, this Pacers series for the Bucks this year was unique in that sense that they saw each other a lot 11 times this season, um, including the five regular season games here. And that's a lot of times to see the same team. Um, so after a while, you know what they're trying to do. You, the scouting report, you know it like the back of your hand at that point. So it's like, what can we tweak here? What can we throw out that might change it up? Or what can we do differently here? We saw this wasn't working. So let's pivot to this guy on the bench or let's make this adjustment here. So having the depth to be able to play in a few different ways in particular is also really important. That's what I see when I look at Minnesota where you're like, they they had to throw a lot of different looks at Denver throughout that seven game series. Um, and that's part of what helped them get over the finish line here because there were some games where they were doubling Jokic every single time he caught that ball in the post. Did not matter. Here comes a double. No hesitation. Here it comes. In other games, they were like, you know what? Cat got him. We're just going to show a little help, maybe late, or we're going to rotate. And it's, it's all about that game, that cat and mouse game within the game for uh, NBA teams. So uh, with the Bucks being in the category that they're in now with those luxury teams that didn't happen to make it out the first round, I do wonder, in addition to like what we see next season, how things start unfolding in the next two to three years. Are there going to be some teams like, you know what? Actually, this is too expensive. Let me get out of here and let's try a different route. Or I feel too handicapped to like actually build a team that's going to be able to compete. It's going to be fascinating to see the ramifications of this new CBA throughout the league over the next couple of years with, as you said, this year was kind of like that filling out. We're not really imposing things yet. We're, we're just starting to see what it's going to be like. This year was like your your first credit card. Where exactly, you were just the credit card like, in college. Oh, oh, this is yeah, right. You signed up for it outside of a Bucks game, and you got a free <laughs> koozie or something. And yeah, that's what this year was. I have two quick things for you as we start to wrap this up. Um, a or B? You choose which one. Let's go with B. All right, so B. Taking a look, we mentioned the the six uh, straight times now or six straight seasons. We'll have a different champion. Uh, another one of those parallels and similarities between the Bucks and Nuggets is granted small sample size here, but I think it's really the Bucks and Nuggets that you would look at as the teams that did not repeat and say, well, those were the teams best positioned and had the best chance and probably are kicking themselves saying, man, that was it. That was our chance. And, and for the Bucks, certainly you point to that injury for Chris Middleton. Um, 
but again, it's it's one of the bigger what ifs that we're going to experience yeah. in Bucks franchise history. That what happens if Chris Middleton doesn't get injured? Still firmly believe the Bucks are at least in the finals and maybe back to back champions. There, Denver too. It, it I don't want to get it in front of ourselves here, but it it really feels like. Um, at the very least, that was the Western Conference Finals that we witnessed between the Timberwolves and the Nuggets. I hesitate to say NBA Finals because the Celtics, granted against some inferior competition, but they have been mopping the floor with the opposition, and they're a very good team. Um, but it feels like Denver was really poised, and they were going for that one seed this year too. Yeah. So I think those are the two teams. You think that to Toronto – can't really put them in the same class. Kawhi Leonard left and they were kind of holding it together as best they could. The Warriors championship, we've talked about this before. It really found, felt like found money for the Warriors. So that was a different one as well. These two are the, are the big ones for me that you would really point to and say, man, what if with those two teams? Uh, the last one is another one of those theories that I mentioned. So have you seen this? It's It's been all over TikTok. The burnt toast theory are you familiar with this camille isn't that like a ha a glass half full type of basically life yeah, outlook? It's, it's something bad happened but you know what big picture something good actually came from that something bad happening you burnt your toast so you you spent some time to to make a second piece and oh i didn't get in a car accident on the way to work and and things like that um so that's been floated out there as well as you know is this season just a burnt toast theory um look i think for the bucks if we were to combine last season and this season into one, then sure, you can say, well, if this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen. If you don't lose in the first round, you don't go out and trade for Damian Lillard. We've talked about it. Um, I'm sure it'll come up again during the course of the offseason. We still firmly believe it was the right move to make. As much as we both love Drew Holiday, it was the same results over and over. And, and look, even if the Bucks hadn't made that trade and they were healthy, you're still going to run into the same issue if you don't have Giannis. You're you're going to be able to slow down the Pacers more, but where's the scoring going to come from? So, um, uh, that's that's something that yeah yeah maybe you had to lose in the first round to experience that. Um, the coaching change is a different conversation, but maybe there's a burnt toast theory with that change that prompted another change. Sure, I, I think the other big piece that you see kicked around there. And we should give credit credit on this one because this was another one that I was combing through uh, Bucks Reddit. It's the off season; we got to find something here. <laughs> and uh, this was from Sabertooth seven five three, who put this out there halfway there, right? That uh, again, one of the big things that we looked at or, or just came out of of discussing is maybe you reevaluate. And I think this is the biggest piece to take from this is maybe this forces you to reevaluate and for guys like Giannis too, to say, you know what, maybe I do need to play in X amount of games. Maybe it means I miss all NBA honors because I'm playing in 64 games or 65 mm -hmm. games um, or, or 63 games. I should say, maybe it means that, but we've seen two years in a row injuries, uh, three years in a row injuries, but especially two of those three years really derailed our season. So maybe that is the good that uh, comes out of this from the Bucks. The other theory that was kicked around was, hey, you got to get more athletic and you got to get younger. You learn that with this loss. I mean, it's another thing that you and I have harped on. I think you learned that for three straight years. Yeah. It's just the challenge of, look, what the Bucks need, every team needs. And that's going to make it all the more difficult to round out this roster this offseason. Yeah, especially when you don't have a lot of money to go out there and get it. Um, so, yeah, those are all really interesting theories. And I think a good way to end the show on like a positive uh, spiritual note, somewhat of like the burnt toast theory, like, you know, things work out for a reason. You know, like it fits into what Giannis was saying about that last season was a failure. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's not a failure. Like we're we're continuing to grow from it. Like the journey is important as well. So that's definitely one way uh, to look at it. I mean, ultimately. We won another championship here in Milwaukee, so it's trying to figure out the best way to get to that. And everything that we've talked about is something to consider along that path, along that journey for the next season, because there are some questions the Bucks are going to have to answer in an NBA landscape that is getting better all around them. So, uh, listen, I'm, I'm here for the concept of the burnt toast theory. I, that's something I subscribe to in my personal life. You can probably tell from the mellow vibes <laughs> that I'm giving out. Uh, but 
thinking of him like that also just fits like kind of Giannis's mind frame but at the same time like they want to win it's not like a just a flowy like hey you know hey we, we tried our best it is what it is like oh, we'll get him tomorrow yeah like they're trying to get to that championship and I think sometimes that the losses and that bitter taste in your mouth of not getting there um can be additional motivation I mean we saw it in that bubble year which preceded the championship year of how the net that team approached things next year so it'd be really interesting to see how this team approaches next season given how this season ended for them uh it it, it will certainly be one of the more interesting I, I feel like we've said this a couple of times one of the more interesting off seasons in franchise history here for the bucks and they're not alone there's there's a handful of teams that it's going to be very interesting to see how they go about doing business this summer Later tonight, speaking of those teams and those comps, we get our first glimpse at the East Finals in Boston, the Pacers and the uh, Celtics. Uh, something's got to give in this series. The Celtics have have, uh, have struggled at home. The Pacers have yet to lose at home in the playoffs. Celtics have been very good. I think the best team in the league in the road, on, in, on the road in the playoffs here. So that'll be interesting to see. And, man, I mean – <laughs> If we get an NBA Finals that is Minnesota Timberwolves, Indiana Pacers, it is full-on NFL uh, method that has infected the NBA here. So that is certainly going to be interesting. And then on Wednesday, the uh, West Finals start, which I think will carry much more interest from Bucks fans to uh, seemingly throw their rooting interest behind the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. Speaking of Wednesday, Ty of the Eurostep is going to be joining us and taking a look at some of those young players that uh, he had a chance specifically to cover, covering the Wisconsin herd this season. So we'll get his thoughts on those guys uh, on the Bucks, their direction, where they're headed, and some of the things that we've discussed in the past few shows here. And one last reminder as well, um, you got a little more than a day left to cast your vote for what we should kick off flashback Friday with, and it's starting to tighten now, Camille, your four choices, the trade that sent Brandon Jennings to the Pistons and brought Brandon Knight. Oh, by the way, some throw named Chris Middleton, uh, taking a look back at Herb Cole's decision to sell the team and everything that came from that, the return to the Mecca for that one game against Kyrie Irving and the Celtics, with some interesting comments from Kyrie in 2017. Yeah, yeah, or very apropos, the hiring of Mike Budenholzer, who we just touched on on yesterday's show, going to the Phoenix Suns. So again, you have until Wednesday afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, to cast your vote for that. Right now, the hiring of Bud is narrowly edging out the Brandon Jennings, Brandon Knight, and some guy named Chris Middleton trade. So a uh, little over a day left to get your vote out there. And uh, whichever one finishes with the most votes by Wednesday afternoon, that's what we're going to kick off our Flashback Friday series with on uh, this upcoming Friday. It'll be the uh, first in a series that we plan on doing throughout the course of the offseason here. Every single Friday in the offseason, we're going to take a look back. We put together a list of, boy, 20 or so different topics, players, whatever it was, a number of things. It's not just a player or year of the team. Right. It could be an event or a game, and we're going to continue to add to it. We're going to bring back some of the losers in the poll question, too. So especially with these close votes, may not signal the end of that Brandon Jennings, Brandon Knight trade. Um, but we're going to have that vote out there every single week for you to determine what we talk about on each Friday's show. So again, Ty is going to join us tomorrow from the Eurostep to uh, take a look at some of the youngsters on this team. And a little over a day left to cast your vote for what we cover in the first episode of Flashback Friday. For Camille, I am Justin. Thanks for tuning in and uh, listening, watching us on YouTube as well. You've been listening and watching Locked on Bucks. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow.